Cool. Uh, <laughs> thanks for showing up tonight, guys. Um, so my name is Paul. I work at a company called Drop in Toronto. Uh, and tonight I'll be talking about Prisma and learning and prototyping with GraphQL. Uh, so just a show of hands, how many people are here are familiar with GraphQL in terms of they've used it at their company or they've hobbied with it personally? So most people, yeah. Okay. So maybe this talk is a little bit too basic for most people here, but I hope you guys still learn something new about tools in the GraphQL community and how you can better prototype GraphQL APIs. Um, so of course, uh, this talk is called Prototyping and Learning with Prisma and Prisma Cloud, but it should really be called How to Get a GraphQL API Set Up in basically the, little, the smallest amount of time possible. Um, and interesting fact, the other Paul here has talked about Prisma in the past, back in April. So I think it's pretty legit that both Pauls have talked about Prisma in the span of a year. So you know it's a tool to at least look out for and see how it evolves over time. Uh, so, so, uh, what I'll be talking about tonight is a little bit about me, about Prisma, and about how you can start using Prisma today to rapidly prototype GraphQL APIs. So just, again, uh, software engineer at Drop. Uh, we don't use GraphQL there, uh, but uh, I've used GraphQL in the past job before. I've, migra I've, I've migrated a REST API all the way to GraphQL, uh, from prototyping it all the way up to production. Uh, nowadays, I'm more of a GraphQL hobbyist, I guess you can call me. Uh, I work on some open source stuff in the GraphQL uh, Go community, which is interesting because most people are either in the JavaScript world or the Ruby Rails world. Um, I kind of work in the, uh, the, the Go community for GraphQL. It's a small community, but it's, it's getting there. It's evolving. Um, again, I'm here to share some of the love I've experienced in the GraphQL community, both online and in person. So why Prisma? Uh, I think, especially starting off as a GraphQL API developer, there's a lot of steps and indirections about what tools to use, what frameworks to use, and even what language to use. And then once you get past those, there's a bunch of problems with, um, but there's a bunch of problems with you know, performance and getting it right first time around. And obviously, you will have to iterate on it, but to get to that point, you need to have something to start off with first, and that's where Prisma kind of comes in. So again, just problems that uh, a new GraphQL developer might experience, things like what languages or frameworks they should use, uh, what their database should look like, what database they should use, should they use an ORM on top, um, and at the GraphQL level, what their schema should look like. These are things that you know people have discussed a bunch about, and there's uh, there's rules and tutorials and guides on how to create the best GraphQL API out there, but to a new developer in this in, in foray into GraphQL, it's something that's you know a little bit too extensive, a little bit too dense to really get around to. So I think one thing that uh, as developers we should always be doing is focusing on the uh, focusing on the what and less about the how. So all those problems and steps I talked about in the past slide are things that are involved in the how. So you know, how should I fetch data securely and performantly? How should I serve it up to the client? Um, but we should really be focusing on what we're building and the problems that we're solving. And I think Prisma kind of fits in this sweet, nice sweet spot where it solves all the problems of the how and gets you right to, the, to what you're building and the problems you're solving. So of course, the topic of tonight's talk is Prisma. Uh, it's an open source framework, which I'll talk about. But it's on GitHub, you can look at the code, you can see all the new features coming out and uh, get involved, it's open source. So what is Prisma? Um, Prisma is kind of this like database layer that sits in front of your actual database. So people call it a database proxy. Um, basically what it does is it takes your database, it can be SQL, Postgres, Mongo, I think they're supporting a bunch of new ones uh, upcoming uh, in this year, but it runs a GraphQL API on top. So it turns your traditional uh, database and then it basically generates a schema and allows you to query against it and run mutations and uh, all the things you would expect from a GraphQL API. So it gives you your basic, uh, basic operations like CRUD, like um, you can read data, update, delete, and whatnot, but also gives you some advanced operations. So your querying can get pretty advanced with nested relations and you know, like I want to find all the posts from this user after this date and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Also, it gives you the ability to do uh, pagination out of the box. 
So, um, you know, pagination is something that I think we've kind of agreed on the consensus to, which is this relay style pagination. Uh, it gives you that out of the box and also gives you things like uh, subscriptions on uh, updating and deleting and creating data. Um, all of these things are um, things you might run into as you kind of foray into GraphQL and you'll eventually need. So the ability for Prisma to provide that out of the box is something that's quite magical and something that you, uh, you can take advantage of from right from the beginning when you start with Prisma. So basically what it does is it takes your GraphQL uh, query or mutation and then Prisma is in front of your database and it transforms it into SQL or whatever language or whatever database you have underneath it. So another thing it provides is this thing called the, a declarative data schema. So as developers, as backend API developers, uh, your, schema is ever, your schema is always going to be evolving, right? So then you have to write migrations for it, you have to change your database, uh, database schema. Um, and starting off as a, you know, when you're prototyping an API, this can be quite simple, right? You're just writing a migration that changes your schema. But once you get it into production, it becomes quite difficult because you have to ensure that your new migration doesn't break anything in the past and adding fields uh, don't break your API. So basically what Prisma allows you to do is write your schema. So you can write that, you know, your, your post type uh, has an ID and has a name. And it'll just transform that into SQL and run it for you. So you don't have to worry about writing migrations. You don't have to worry about uh, whether or not you know, you're adding a new field to break your API because Prisma does that out of the box and ensures that it won't. So later on, you might want to add a new field to your post. So let's say I want to add a description to my post. Right? It'll figure out what exactly that migration looks like and run it for you. Um, and if there's anything that looks off, Prisma will warn you and even prevent you from running the migration or prevent you from update, updating your schema so that you don't break your API. So why is Prisma useful? I think as GraphQL developers, there's always this problem of transforming your query or your mutation into um, either ORM code or uh, raw SQL Mongo code. So obviously that mapping isn't exactly one-to-one -one all the time. But it would be nice if it was, right? So that's what Prisma provides. So when you're serving up, or sorry, when you're uh, responding to a GraphQL um, query or mutation, rather than you know having to figure out what that code looks like in terms of SQL or your ORM, ORM code, uh, you're just writing GraphQL mutations and queries on the other end. So it simplifies the mental model, of, again, as I mentioned, simplifies the mental model of transforming your GraphQL request that, that goes to your API into uh, that goes through database layer. So rather than you know doing this like kind of weird mapping uh, that isn't one to one, you can do a mapping that is almost one to one. Um, again, as we're prototyping an API, we want to do the least number of steps possible to get our API running. So it lowers the number of steps that you have to be worried about when building your uh, your GraphQL API from the very beginning. And obviously, you get all the benefits of GraphQL, but at the database level. So you get your type safety, you get your declarative requests all the benefits that you see in GraphQL APIs, but at a level that's a bit deeper than just at the API. So I think one quote that I found in the docs was pretty kind of, it summarizes the entire benefit of Prisma is that it allows APIs to think about, it allows API developers to simply think about what data they need instead of worrying about how to securely and performantly retrieve it from the database. So I think this one quote really summarizes the power of Prisma and why uh, new, new GraphQL developers should be using it to kind of experience GraphQL and all the benefits that you get from building a GraphQL API. So obviously, if I want to use Prisma, how do I use Prisma? So you have your, um, you have your traditional front end, which might be a web app, it might be uh, a mobile app, and then you have your GraphQL API. And then your Prisma server kind of sits in the middle of your GraphQL API and your database. But the issue there is, I need to deploy my Prisma API, and I need to deploy my database somewhere. And as a new GraphQL developer, these are questions that you should not be worried about. These are concerns that are kind of just trivial, and they're part of the implementation details. When you want to prototype, you want to do things fast, you want to try out new things. So obviously, you want to kind of just skip over this step. And that's where Prisma Cloud comes in. Uh, so Prisma Cloud is this web-based console to manage your GraphQL, or sorry, your Prisma uh, service but also provides you a free demo server uh, in order to build up your Prisma API. So what this means is it actually gives you a free, uh, free database in a shared cluster, and also it deploys your Prisma service API for you. 
So you get these two things for free. So when you're starting off building out your GraphQL API, these are things that are, are really beneficial because you don't have to worry about deploying them and managing them in the future. It also gives you nice tools like deployment histories. So uh, if you're working on a team or even if you're working alone, you can really see how your schema has evolved over time and see um, if you need to roll back or if there's any issues with your schema. Uh, it gives you a data browser, so it's kind of like this, uh, you can just look into your data in the web. You can edit your data, you can delete data. Uh, it also gives you metrics on uh, server response times and queries and uh, things like what's the most popular mutation ran in the past 24 hours and uh, very field level metrics on uh, your Prisma service. So obviously the question is, how do you get started, right? Uh, Prisma uh, provides a CLI that you can install using NPM. And you just type that in, gives you a CLI. Um, so I'll just go briefly through how easy it is to set up a Prisma service and the GraphQL API right now. Hello? Turn it on? Yes. Oh. All right, okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, all right, cool. Uh, let's see if I can get out of this. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, after installing Prisma command line tools, uh, basically all you do is you go Prisma init. And it'll kind of walk you through the steps of setting up your Prisma service. Uh, so obviously when you're prototyping, you don't want to worry about uh, deploying your API or your Prisma service. So uh, what it provides is you can actually use your demo server uh, and then it gives you a free Prisma service and also a free uh, shared database instance. Let's go like that. Uh, for now, we won't generate the Prisma client just because I want to show you what you can do without the Prisma client first. So if we open up the files that it's generated, you have this YAML file, which is pretty much your, oh, whoops. You have this YAML file, which is pretty much uh, a configuration for your Prisma service. So it gives you this endpoint and also points to where your uh, schema is uh, in your folder. So also you have this data model.prisma, which is, um, as you saw in a previous slide, it's basically what your, uh, your GraphQL schema looks like. So from the get-go, you get this user type, but then let's say I wanted to add a new type. I can just go create a new type here. Oops. And Prisma provides uh, some things on top of the GraphQL SDL that you might normally see. Uh, so it provides this unique directive, which basically means uh, it'll generate a unique ID for this type whenever you create it. Um, there's also new, or there's also uh, things like uh, JSON fields and daytime fields that you might not see in a traditional, or when you're creating a GraphQL schema, you won't have that from the get-go. But uh, with Prisma, you will. So let's say I wanted to record the, uh, the created at for the post. Let's go daytime. Let's say I wanted to also record when posts are updated. So it's updated at daytime as well. And then let's say I wanted to relate users to posts. So obviously a user can have many posts and the post has one user author. So it's as simple as just declaring another field on your type. So an author is type of user, it's required, and user has many posts. Oops. Right. Uh, the one thing though is that uh, let's say you want to add a field that's only exposed to your GraphQL API but not to your client, right? So let's say I add a field called secret field or something like that and it's a JSON type which is something that's unique to Prisma um, that you don't have to do anything extra to add it in. And then you can create, uh, you can also add default values to fields as well. So with this, uh, with this other directive called defaults, 
can specify that the secret field of type JSON has a default value of just empty objects or empty hash. Um, and then when you're ready to go, all you have to do is go back to your command line and then run Prisma deploy. And then it'll take that schema that you have and then deploy it to Prisma Cloud and then you get this free, oh, whoops. Field ID is reserved as, oh. Oops. So, show it again. Uh, you deploy it and it gives you this uh, GraphQL API and also deploys your schema to uh, the shared database that you get for free. So when you're ready to go, you just go to your endpoint. And then you can kind of take a look at the schema that, it, oh, let's zoom in a bit. You can take a look at the schema that it generated from the types that you have. So we had user and post. So it gives you your normal queries, like querying a user based on its ID, based on any of the attributes and the type. And also you can do things like uh, pagination over uh, all users, pagination over all posts. And if you look in the user type, you can also grab a user's post. And there's more filtering and querying operations that you can do there. And on, on the mutation side, it gives you all your basic CRUD uh, operations, so creating, deleting, updating, and whatnot. It also gives you subscriptions. So you, you can subscribe to uh, when a new user is created, when a new post is created. You can also subscribe to when a user creates a new post, and so on and so forth. So out of the box, just by declaring two simple types, we get all of these operations for free, and um, it's really easy to build your GraphQL API from, from there. So obviously, um, this is quite simple, but let's say we want to go a little bit deeper into how we can use this to actually build our GraphQL API. So right now it exposes all of these fields to the client, but we don't want clients to be able to just willy-nilly go create posts and users and deleting them as they wish. Obviously we want to put something in between the client and the, graph or, and the Prisma service so that we can kind of control what the client sees and what they can do. Um, so going back to the slides. So yeah, as I said, uh, there's obviously a lot more you can do with Prisma than just you know creating a simple GraphQL API from the schema. Uh, you want to do other things as well with it, right? So how do you do things like uh, authentication, authorization? These are simple things that you should be uh, keeping in mind when you're building a GraphQL API, obviously. Things like pre-processing the query, so uh, maybe you want to add a default value to an argument. You can also post-process the response, so maybe you want to change the value of a, a field. Uh, you can also modify a schema. So in the case of having that secret field, we obviously don't want to expose that to the client right away. Um, we can hide it behind our schema, which is basically to say, don't declare in your schema for your GraphQL API. And also a lot more. So basically this is where Prisma client comes in. Um, it's hard to see, but basically all you need to do to generate a client is Add these lines here. And basically what this is saying is every time we deploy our Prisma service, we're gonna generate a corresponding client. And I'll get into what a client is in the next slide. So this is where Prisma code gen comes in. Code gen just means code generation. But uh, what it does is it takes your schema and it generates a, a, a client in JavaScript, TypeScript, Flow, or now Go as well. Uh, and what you can do is you can actually use the native constructs of your the language that you're programming in to query against your GraphQL, uh, sorry, your Prisma API. So one of the cool things about this is rather than you know writing out your potentially deeply nested GraphQL query, you can just use um, ch things like chaining and things like um, things like uh, something called Fluent API to basically query against your GraphQL API. So you can say, I want all the posts for a given user. So you can just go user.post. Something as simple as that is a lot better uh, once you have a client that's basically generated from your GraphQL schema. So rather than typing all that, in JavaScript you can just go prisma.user um, of ID of one and I want all the posts by that user. So basically the next step is obviously building a GraphQL API on top of the Prisma API so that we can add things like authorization, authentication, all the things I mentioned before. Um, 
So for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to uh, do this in JavaScript, but you can do this in basically either, or you can do this in any language that uh, you have, that you know how to use or uh, Prisma has support for. So going back to this. So going back to where we were before, we have this prisma.yaml file and this data model.prisma, which declares our schema for our uh, Prisma service. Um, so I've added a couple extra fields here. So user, again, is just uh, has an ID, has a name, created at, deleted at, or created at, updated at, again, it has posts, and also that subsecret field. Um, the posts, let's say I wanted to add a new field called score, right? I want to track you know, how people are responding to posts, whether, whether or not they like it or dislike it. Um, so given that this is our schema, we can build a GraphQL API on top of that. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm just using, oh, whoops. I'm using a library called uh, GraphQL Yoga, which is pretty much the way to go if you're building a GraphQL API in, in JavaScript nowadays. Uh, it gives you a lot of things from out of the box, so it's quite simple to get it set up. Um, so let's run what we have so far. So right now, our type defs just say we have a query called hello world. It returns a string. Um, our resolvers for that hello world query, which return hello world. Um, and basically, it's just passing in the type definitions and resolvers, and then we start the server at port 3000. So even if you're not too familiar with JavaScript, it's quite easy to grok this and see what's going on. So then let's just run our server now. Cool, and now if you go back to, whoops. Oh. So if you go back to our browser, and then our server's running locally. You can see we have this root query that gives hello world and it returns a string. So that's all cool. But let's say I want to use that Prisma client that was generated. So to generate Prisma client, all you have to go is can do uh, let's see Prisma deploy because I didn't deploy this yet. Oh, whoops. Sorry, <laughs> this is not set up. Just copy this. So again, we'll deploy our Prisma API. Uh, but now this time, after we deploy it, it actually generates a Prisma client. And we can just go through what it generated. So in this generated folder, um, this Prisma schema.js file basically is just what you saw uh, when I showed you what the schema looked like when you deploy it to Prisma. It gives you all your queries and your mutations and your subscriptions and all the types associated with it. It also gives you this, um, this bunch of kind of generated code, but it gives you this Prisma client which has all these functions like user and creating posts and updating posts and whatnot. So we can actually use this client that was generated in the language of JavaScript and then just um, use the syntax of Prisma client to query against our Prisma API. So all you have to do is just get that uh, imported here. So in JavaScript, you just require it. Require generated Prisma. Now let's say I wanted to be able to query uh, a user by their ID. And obviously this is something that's already supported by Prisma, but it's not supported by our GraphQL API because all we have right now is just hello world. So we can declare a new post, or declare a new user type. Name, string. And then when a user requests, oh, oops. So right now, we're just adding an extra query to a query that says, uh, if, someone, if a client wanted to request the user by their ID, uh, we'd let them. Oops. So 
So we can just use that Prisma client that generated. And if you have something like uh, ID or you have something like VS Code, it gives you your your autocomplete. So obviously we're going to query by our user here. Oh, not upstart user, just user. And then just by args dot ID. Then we can restart our server. Now you can see that it has this extra query called user. And obviously if I can go something like user ID one. Obviously we don't have any users because we haven't created any, but if we did, uh, you would see it there. And you know, if it didn't exist, it would just return null. And um, you can also add more uh, queries and mutations on top of your GraphQL API, or sorry, your Prisma API. Um, and it, it just, it's pretty simple. You just create new queries and mutations and then you use a Prisma client um, and all of its functions that it provides because you've created this basic code gen client that's always gonna be matching up to your uh, Prisma schema. So every time you update your schema, you'll get a new client that's you know, uh, ready to use and it'll be always up to date. So one of the great things about Prisma, uh, and something that a lot of people are concerned about is, you know, once you start using Prisma, how easy is it to kind of move away from it? Uh, there's always this issue of vendor lock-in where if you start using Prisma, you know, like, am I screwed if they stop uh, maintaining it? And the issue is, or the answer is no, because underneath it all is still your, your database, right? It's still there, all the data is still intact. Uh, and you, what you can do is, rather than, you know, using Prisma one day, you can start writing, um, your ORM code or your SQL code if you ever feel like Prisma isn't serving your needs correctly. Um, and again, you can deploy Prisma anywhere, so uh, it fits well within your workflow. Um, it has minimal dependencies. All of it lives in one Docker image, so you can, de you can really deploy this anywhere. It's really flexible. Um, but let's say that you know, I'm prototyping a GraphQL API, I have my Prisma Cloud uh, demo server, and now I want to deploy my GraphQL uh, API that I just made so that you know, I can start writing a front end for it or someone else can query against it. So personally, I like using something like uh, Apex Now or Lambdas or any sort of like quick prototyping tool to deploy your GraphQL API. So demo through is just me typing in now and then it'll deploy it and magic happens and you get to see it on the web. Um, but I won't go into that. Uh, so just to recap, again, uh, I went through it pretty quickly, but Prisma makes it really easy for you to set up a GraphQL API. Uh, you, there's not many things you have to worry about. So you, know, like you don't have to worry about a database. You don't have to worry about uh, where you're deploying their database. Um, and especially for new GraphQL developers, this is something that's quite magical because you get a lot of things out of the box and it's super quick and super easy to get set up with GraphQL and start developing your API and uh, iterate, iterating upon it because, you know, like, again, going back to the main problem it solves is developers want to be more focused on the what and less about the how and Prisma really takes that how and throws it out and you just worry about the what you're building and uh, the, the, the magic behind Prisma and uh, how quick it is to set up your GraphQL API. So I guess most importantly is just have fun with GraphQL. There's so much you can do and it's a, it's a young community and there's a lot of ways to get involved. Uh, Prisma is just one of the ways you can contribute back to open source. Um, but regardless of what language or what framework you use, you can really uh, make an impact in the GraphQL community by you know, working with uh, people that have worked with those frameworks and languages and contributing back to uh, building out new integrations and features with GraphQL.